Minister, and uh, eight minutes I'll tell you um, that you have two minutes left, yeah. and we wish us to ask you some questions. Please uh, allow us some time in your submission, but the floor is yours and the ten minutes is yours, so yeah. welcome. Um, well, I, as I said, I made a written submission as well, which we've probably got in front of you, uh, and it's no point going through all of that. Um, my main concern is really um, the destruction of the environment that would take place uh, if we're going to go ahead with this plan. I have swum in the Makarora River, if you, to give you a bit of background. Uh, I have visited um, the Smetley Farm and seen the potential destruction of prime area of land. Um, I arrived in New Zealand in 1967. The Tukituki River at the time was one of our favourite spots to go swimming in. You never had to worry about um, uh, any pollution in there. Uh, and having come from Holland, uh, where we were given warnings on the radio about the cadmium content in the river and don't swim in it today, uh, it, it was quite an eye-opener for me that in New Zealand you could actually jump in rivers in those days and not be worried about anything. You, and if you went up country, you could even drink from the rivers, which was unheard of um, in, in, my, in my background. Um, so that's, that's, as I said, my main concern. Um, the second one is, uh, if I look at the um, Hawke's Bay Regional Council mission plan, uh, violent, uh, vibrant community, prosperous economy, clear and healthy environment, and now for future generation. I think that's slightly the wrong way around. I do think, I do believe that the clean and healthy environment would be the number one priority for the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. Um, if we're going to put uh, the economy aside, then um, we can't put it aside, but it sh certainly should not uh, be the driver of the actions of the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. Um, the final part of my concern is, um, well, not quite the final, the second to final part is, the biosecurity in this country isn't that hot. Um, and I'm thinking about if the farming community suddenly is conf consulted, uh, confronted with foot and mouth disease, what that would do to our economy and our potential plans for this um, uh, dam uh, suggestion. Uh, we haven't had a good, very good uh, record in that respect. Uh, we, I can recall the uh, Ross River virus mosquitoes that were being sprayed right here in Napier not so long ago. Uh, the foul brood in bees, uh, the Argentine wood ant. The, we, we, don't, we don't seem to manage to keep some of these nasties out very well and there's no security of saying that foot and mouth will never, never appear. Uh, the future part, the drought years, um, I think it's a case of we're going to have to learn to live with that um, and perhaps adjust our farming practices to the, the environment. Um, and the other thing that concerns me a little bit is that um, the, the feeling I have that governments and management within the regional council is being, being confused in that, um, and as I said, I don't... I don't want to insult anybody, but it feels like um, all these councillors that have been elected by us uh, ratepayers are sitting around the table rubber stamping decisions that the, re that the regional council management has made. Um, as I said, it's not from the point of an insult, but purely from the perception that me and several other people that have spoken to me have heard about this. And that's virtually uh, all I wish to take your time up with. Thank you, sir. Three questions. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your very thoughtful presentation, uh, Joseph. Uh, do you believe that the regional councils, when they're making a decision about investing $80 million into the scheme, should uh, uh, have the highest standards of fiduciary duty in the taking that decision? Oh, absolutely. Um, but I think I can give you quite a few good companies that will return 10 or 12% return on your, on your money uh, quite easily. Um, I'm, not, I'm not talking necessarily about a return, I'm talking about there have been lots of cases of recently in courts where uh, finance houses have had directors who have been find, found guilty mm. because they simply relied on management's opinions rather than finding out for themselves. Mm. Mm. There's a new standard for fiduciary duty and I'm just wondering if you agree that we should apply that here. Oh absolutely, yeah. 
Do you think that the uh, regional councillors should have access to the complete updated, uh, with no uh, uh, with no exceptions, uh, 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 business case for this before making the decision? I, th I think it would be uh, completely. Uh, it, it puts it back to the rubber stamping idea. If you do, if you cannot have all access to all the information, you cannot make that decision properly. Thank you. And the <clears throat> third element of my question is one of the key issues here is conditions precedent of 40 million cubic metres. Do you think the regional councils themselves must be able to assure themselves that the 40 million cubic metres is contracted unconditionally from the farmers and that the investing company, the, the, the water supply company, is committed unconditionally to supply that 40 million cubic metres? Not only that, but also um, when the whole plan came out, the first thing was where are all these people who are going to benefit from it, lining up with the chequebook saying, hey, this is a great idea, here is my first million dollars to put it together. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Councillor Ben. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your submission, <coughs> Joseph. Um, you talked about concerns about biosecurity, mm -hmm. and I didn't quite work out the link between that and the dam build. Can you yeah, explain that? Yeah, no, that's right. Well, the beneficiaries of the dam build are no doubt going to be dairy farms as well. And uh, that was the part of saying, hey, what happened in New Zealand if tomorrow we discovered food and mouth had, had sneaked into the country? Uh, that which would, a whole lot of this farmers that are currently looking at $8.56 a, a kilo for return suddenly find themselves nowhere to sell their product to or having to destroy their animals. All right? And that suddenly a bankrupt farmer is not going to pay for any water from that point of view. Other questions? Oh, thank you, Councillor Pike. Yeah, hi. hi. Um, it's interesting that you're swimming back in the, in the 60s and 70s and, and the talkie talk. You're aware that, of course, the raw sewage was being pumped into the river at that time. It, it never seemed to have affected us. Okay. Uh, Thank you. It, uh, so, you know, but also you, you didn't see any algal blooms or anything like that at the time. Uh, but and certainly you wouldn't have to worry about things like cadmium um, like we had in Holland. But that was harder to control because the river came from France, went through Belgium and came into Holland. So they had a much bigger job to uh, keep the rivers clean. Be those clean. other fellas, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? How happy are you with your football team? Yeah, wasn't that a, wasn't that a score? <laughs> Five one. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. All right. We. We are, we are running a little ahead of time. Um, a bit of levity there. Uh, Mr Hugh Ritchie, are you ready to go? Or to present, not to go. All right. Right, 10 minutes. Um, I'll tell you when eight minutes are up, and uh, if you wish us to ask you some questions, please allow us some time. I certainly hope you, hope you won't you. take that long. Thank so, you. thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present here on this pretty important matter. Um, <clears throat> for the record, I'm curry, currently an irrigated farmer who intends to um, uptake some of this particular water. I have been involved with the processes to date in terms of getting to this point. Um, I'm also a Director of Irrigation New Zealand and um, have been involved with water issues over the last 14 years at a national level, so I have a reasonable understanding of not only the local issues but bigger issues. And again, reading other submissions, it appears that I've omitted a few of the obvious points um, in mine. Um, firstly, obviously that the conditions <coughs> of, for the water use need to be viable for everybody to use it. So. Again, that's around the, the plan change. The demand for uptake is such that the risk of the investment is, is acceptable and that the long-term dividend creates an acceptable dividend in the, in the wider sense for the whole community. So with those sort of things said, I, I do support the Regional Council investing in this project. Um, and I think it is right and correct to do so on many fronts. Um, public benefit does occur from this type of investment and the, motion, the notion that it is only private gain for, for this investment is, is absolutely not accurate. Um, 
probably more so on economic development is a critical issue for Hawke's Bay where we currently sit at the bottom of nearly all the, the indicators. Primary industry is the number one industry that drives um, our fortunes in Hawke's Bay at the moment and, and drought has far-reaching consequences. And, and it's not just for the farmers, it actually affects the whole community. I mean, I think they worked out about $600 million came out on the last decent drought of this area. Lack of consistency of, of productivity or reduces the ability for businesses, and that's not farming businesses, and that's all businesses, to develop with confidence and make investments in their own businesses. So we need to create this consistency to enable primary industry and then the secondary industries to develop. So, sure, it might be sh immediate industries that actually drive um, on the back of farming, but equally those businesses with skills and technology can actually start second horizon businesses to move on. Um, and again, you know, there's a very good examples of work just recently done on Tamuka Transport in Timaru uh, or in the South Island. Um, you know, pre and post dam study, very in good economic indicator of how businesses outside the farming have, have developed massively. And, and it's reasonably accepted that if for every dollar made on farm, there's three dollars off farm that is made. So again, the, the notion that this is just a, a benefit to farmers is totally incorrect. Again, if we look at water as an investment, it has been very valuable. Opuis shares started at $65 a hectare, and even at that point, farmers sort of said we're reluctant to sign up on the first day, and those shares are now worth $4,000. Um, and, you know, there was at the recent Irrigation New Zealand conference, one of the commentators, Rod Oram, sort of said, well, there's another way of doing this. We can look at, you know, different marketing and, and high-end high marketing and, and value-add. And that is great, and an Australian presenter pointed out straight after that point that actually, unless you've got consistent supply, there's no way businesses can actually um, have the stability of supply and, and ongoing future to make that inve investment in, in further development and, and lifting the value chain. So we're not saying that can't be done, but we do need consistency of supply to enable that to happen. But equally, you know, farming is not without the... You know, it does not say this is a, an economic only decision. Environmental flows are seen as a major public concern. Lifting these flows can occur with using the dam without e affecting economic activity. Um, and obviously if you don't have additional water in the system and you want to leave more water in the river, then that is going to have an impact on, on how economic activity will go forward. And equally, the quality of the, um, the water is also can be managed very well with, with consenting processes and, and in a collective set sense because um, consent conditions can be very strong lever for behaviour. And again, if you look at North Otago Downs irrigation system with your farm environment plans and the water quality that has actually resulted from that, it is um, a very clear that the ability to turn off water to those guys to make them comply is, is a very strong lever that can be pulled. And finally, water used correctly in terms of correct irrigation management can actually be a very strong mitigating tool for reducing nitrogen. Um, so again, uh, nitrogen losses from systems. So again, you know, it's, it's not just a one-way street here. So the Council needs to support this project and it needs to create an air of confidence and surety for all. Um, it needs to show, clearly show this is an investment, not a handout. The whole community does benefit from this, and again, looking at Ashburton and Timaru as examples where this is the case. And this is not a short-term option. This is a long-term, multi-generational asset, and in the short-term, farmers are going to have to work very hard to make this work for them in terms of a financial sense. And I think a unified front to support and create confidence in this project is absolutely needed, and encouragement to get this across the line is critical. So again, thank you for your opportunity to present and I'm um, happy to take some questions, but we need some leadership on this to get this province to move forward and help create this project. So thank you. Thank you, Mr Ritchie. Um, Councillor Belfort. Good morning, you. Morning, Tom. Um, you, if I understood you correctly, you said you intended to take up some of this water, yep. but you sort of implied that that was in a context of a, a, a workable uh, environmental regime. Uh, if, if the Board of Inquiry decision stands as is, would you be taking up water? Um, a good question, Tom. I mean, at the, end, at the moment, point eight 
is a very hard figure for most of us to actually assimilate into our businesses, as I understand, because we're actually, um, our catchment goes out below Shag Rock, then we probably are in a position to, without any too much changes, I think we're probably one of the only catchments that actually do manage to stay under that, that load. But the reality is that until that's converted back to a, a leaching rate per hectare, it's very hard to know where we sit. I certainly know under the land use capability which is also mentioned in the plan, we probably do meet the criteria, we will stay under that, but at point eight I, nobody knows whether the, the land use capability, and well as I, I understand, the land use capability if that's applied to the hectares will actually still breach the point eight, so again it's, there's, there's rights and wrongs, I don't, I don't know, that. that's why we need some clarification. Just one to follow up, in, in, your, in your situation, how, how frequently would you expect to need water? Annually, uh, our system basically re relies on water every year. Every year. Every, every year. And so some of this water will be additional area and some of it will be supplementing our current water. But we just don't get contracts to grow the, the crops we grow without water. So we might not have to use it, but we, if we don't have that water available, we don't get contracts. Simple as that. Councillor Bach. Uh, thank you, Hugh, for a well thought out submission. I would have uh, expected nothing less. Uh, Hugh, do you think the regional councillors should ex uh, uh, exercise the highest standards of fiduciary duty when considering invest the investment of $80 million of ratepayers' money into uh, this particular root scheme? I, I think anybody would expect any, any decision made to be done with the right information, but equally I'd say that just like we're looking at investing, and this is the previous speaker sort of you know, sort of challenged farming to get up and do it, we, we are doing that. And the reality is we don't have all the answers and you have to make, you know, on any investment, you know, a calculated risk. But certainly you can still do that without necessarily relieve, um, leaving yourselves open to, to challenge under, you know, directors not making the right decisions. I'm not making questions about the, about the right or wrong. Is there are standards of fiduciary mm. duty that people have to discharge. Do you expect us to use, exercise that in making this decision? Yeah, just like I'll be doing it and our business will be doing the same point. Do you think the regional council should have access to the complete business case for this without any, without any uh, gaps, omissions, uh, square brackets before making a decision? Yeah, well, as, as, again, you're not going to have a 100% guarantee that it's going to work. No investment does. But, ah. but I certainly think that, yeah, as good, a, as good an information as you can get, you've got to make a decision at some point. All of the available information. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, there's a. <clears throat> and do you think the regional councils should uh, assure councils should assure themselves that the uh, one of the conditions precedent, and in particular, for example, the condition precedent of 40 million cubic metres, should regional councils assure themselves that the contracts for the 40 million cubic metres are unconditional, and then and that the investment, the company, the entity set up to uh, run the Rotanifer Water Storage Scheme, has made a, an unconditional commitment to supply that water before making its decision on whether or not to invest the $80 million. Certainly if the $40 million is seen as the, as the critical point to, to making the, the call as to whether the project goes forward or, or not, is, then obviously you're going to have contracts. Again, the contracts, um, I've got two, two with our lawyers at the moment looking at it, um, and those, again, unconditional. The, the only area is really coming back to, to some of the issues around plan, and, and distribution. So again, I don't know whether, you know, depending on how the uptakes go, whether, whether they'll supply, but once that's all signed off, then that's a conditional contract that we will be obliged to meet. A conditional contract or an unconditional contract? Well, <coughs> it's, it's a contract that has conditions that have to be met. If, they'll decide, if the conditions are all met, then yes, it, it's a contract. So it's a conditional contract? It's a, at the moment, we have a draft contract in front of us. Yep. So there's two things, there's two areas. First of all, that the company can supply us water. So we're not going to sign up an unconditional commitment to pay for cubic metres of water that don't arrive. But assuming that the water is can be delivered to us and the price is there, um, then it is an unconditional contract. But again, the, the, there is things in that contract that need to be addressed before um, anybody can go forward. Thank you. Right, that's our 10 minutes up. Thank you. Um, Mr Ritchie, and please stick around for a cup of tea if you want. We're actually a little bit ahead of time, and I see Mr Sutton Mr. Mr. Chair. sitting there. Oh, Councillor Day. Um, just, just through you, um, Councillor Barker's um, trio of questions, which 
I guess we're going to have to hear 37 times. <laughs> and, and that's right. I, I can't quite see the purpose. But um, I wonder if he can clarify in his first question whether he, in fact, is implying that I and my colleagues will not be exercising um, our full and obligatory fiduciary obligation and duty, because it sounds to me like that. And if that's the case, I take offence. Can I the answer? Sure, can I assure Councillor Dick that is not the case, there's no inference. What I'm saying clearly is that I expect uh, this council, as I would enter, to apply the highest standards of fiduciary duty. And I'm just saying that I think the, uh, uh, the, the submitters have the opportunity to say whether they agree with that or not. And now, if it comes that, uh, that we don't, well then, uh, we don't. But I, don't expect us, I expect us to do exactly that. I'm just making the point that there are high standards of fiduciary duty that we have here, and I expect us to meet them. I expect us to meet them. And so do I. Very good. Thank and you. So I'm not quite sure why you have to ask the question every time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ritchie. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, now we could we could break now for for morning tea. Right. Mr. Sutton, do you wish to have a break and have a cup of tea and a bit of a chat first, or are you happy? I'm quite happy to present my Are you are you are you happy to stick around till ten thirty? So yeah, sure. maybe let's have a let's have a break and a cup of tea. Yeah, good idea. Okay. So do I, do I still get to share the morning tea? You absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, Bill. Thank you. Right, we'll adjourn till ten thirty.